I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was mine too Till I met you
His truth shall reign Heaven and earth Rejoice in His holy name He is the Lord Forever Bless the service. We're reaching out to you with hopes, healing God for the things you've done and things yet to do.
take my dead and raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you today that while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that Jesus Christ came into this world, lived a perfect life, and then died in our place on that cross. And it's through Him today that we have life, true life, that we've been raised from the dead and now we live for You. And we are so grateful for that. And God, that is a a debt that we could never pay on our own. But thank You that You provided the way through Your one and only Son. God, we thank You for this new year as we uh, launch into Uh, 2022 God we know that uh, the past is the past and this is just a reminder today that every day with you is a brand new day God that the the past is not something we are to focus on or to worry about and God even tomorrow you tell us not to worry about because you are a God that is on his throne you are a God that is in control and even though we don't know what the future holds you do and we can trust you And so, Father, we look forward to going into this new year with with the hope that we have in you and in you alone. So, God, I pray that as we worship today, as we study your word together today, that, God, we would be reminded of who you are. We'd be reminded of that hope that we had through your son, Jesus Christ. And, God, I pray that today we would be encouraged through your word. We would be challenged through your word. And God, I pray that you just help us to have hearts that are ready to receive what you have for us. God, thank you for this time of fellowship together, of worship together, and to study together. And thank you for your presence that's here with us. In Christ's name I pray, amen. It's 2022, and we're here, and we made it. And so take a deep breath and like, thank you, God, we made it past 2021. Does anybody else feel like 2021 was a bad sequel to a movie, 2020? Wow, it was crazy. Uh, My 2022 started off a little hard. Um, I lost my cousin that we were praying for. Um, It was like 2.55 uh, on the 1st, where it was, Saturday. I was at the hospital with the family. And so it started off kind of rough. But I'm, uh, I'm getting fatigued with all the... The sadness that we've heard around us, you know, all the families that we've lost and, and, and just not just in the church, but just around. We know a lot of people, but, you know, here's the thing. God is still on the throne and he's still good and he's still worthy of praise and we still put our hope in him. Amen. So let me, let me just ask you this question. Does anybody feel the same way? I found these memes. I started kind of, um, you know, towards the first of the year, I started to see them pop up. And there's some of them I can't share with you from the pulpit because they were just kind of like not appropriate, but they're funny. Um, but there are a few of them that were appropriate, church appropriate, and I thought I would share those with you. And I wonder if you feel the same way about 2022, a little anxiety maybe going into a new year. Here's the first one. How many of you feel like that? Like, we don't know what to expect. It's a little scary. It's like somebody just push it with a stick and let's see what's going what, to happen. How about the next one? Here we go. Before I agree to 2022, I'm going to have to see the terms and conditions. <clears throat> Amen. Go ahead, next one. <clears throat> I like this one. It's 2021 showing 2022 around the workplace. What's a, a circus last year? Okay, go ahead. And oh, look, here comes 2022, right on time. <laughs> I saw another one. It was a dumpster fire. My favorite one is this next one. It says, I hope someone is busy lunging. It used to say 2021, but 2022, before we all climb on, if you know what lunging is, a horse, breaking it, getting it warmed up. We don't want to get on that crazy ride. So anybody else feeling a little bit anxious about 2022? Let's just be honest. It's like, man, it's been crazy for a past couple of years. I think the reason we feel that way is because maybe we had some expectations Maybe we had some hopes uh, that this year would be different than last year, and, you know, we get to the end of it, and we find that it's not everything that we had anticipated, and we're a little frustrated or discouraged, and so now 2022 is in front of us, and we're wondering, how's that going to look? What's it going to look like for us individually, for our families, for our health, for our country, our church? Man, I've thought a lot on that um, the past few weeks. I've just been really stirring in my heart some things. I'll be honest with you, I'm a little fatigued this morning, but i got a lot of things that he's been placing in my heart, a burden, if you will, um, for us as a church, and um, just a challenge to begin a new year. So most of you know I was gone last Sunday. I went to a game with my son, my first NFL football game. It was fun. 
I really appreciated and, and enjoyed hanging out with my son more than I did the game, but the game was pretty cool. But we were in Dallas, and I'm pretty comfortable driving in Dallas, but um, there was one point where it was you know, heavy traffic, and Tanner's driving, and I've got my phone with a GPS on giving me directions, and, uh, and so I'm looking at it, and I feel like I'm pretty good co-pilot, and I'm like, okay, you need to turn right about 150 feet or something like coming up, and, and he turned, and I got it wrong. And then I hear what probably everybody who owns a GPS has ever heard in their life is that one word, recalculating. How many you get offended when you hear that word? I do. So you might as well say, you idiot, you did it wrong. I mean, in fact, I was reading some stories about guys that took the audio file from their GPS and reprogrammed it to say stuff like that. Hey, bonehead, do what I told you to, or you missed your turn again because you're not listening. Recalculating, what does that mean? It means just... The computer or the GPS is doing something in the background that we used to have to do old school way, but in the background, the GPS is mathematically coming up with these solutions, and it's trying to remember, did you want the shortest distance or um, the the quickest route to where you're going? And so it's trying to figure out, um, based on your error, based on your wrong turn, um, it's trying to figure out what is the best way to get you back on route, recalculating. Uh, The word calculated simply means carefully thought out or planned. Um, It's to determine by reasoning, common sense, or practical experience. It means to estimate, to evaluate, to gauge. We're at the beginning of a new year, and it's always a great time to reevaluate, isn't it? You know, you've got one foot in 2021 or just barely out of it, and then 2022, it's a brand new year. Here's the good news for us as Christians. We don't have to wait until January 1st every year to get a new downs or a new set of downs or a new um, do-over. God's mercies are new every morning. Amen? And so every morning we can wake up and go, I blew it again yesterday, God, but thank you that your mercy is brand new this morning, and I'm going to just start again um, fresh and, and try to do this thing right. So... We're at the beginning of a new year, and it's an opportunity for us to evaluate. And maybe for some in the room, we had some expectations um, of what 2021 was supposed to be like, and you get to the end of it, and you just feel like you missed your mark. You missed the goal. You know, one of the first things you do when you get in a car for a trip is you punch in the destination that you want to go in the little GPS, right? So it's like, when this is over, when this trip is over, I want to make sure I reach the destination that I'm headed to. How many of you know that we're all on a journey in this human race, one day it's going to come to an end. Every one of us is on the journey. And every one of us hopefully um, have this in mind. is like one day when it's all done, I hope to reach the destination that I intended to be at. And for us, you hear me say all the time, the most important decision we can make is what we do with the gospel of Jesus Christ because it determines where we're going to end up at, right? Um, but so that's the ultimate journey, the ultimate goal. But how about just as we walk it out here on this earth, what is the end goal? And I would like to talk to you about that for just a few moments because how many of you have made New Year's resolutions? Anybody? Is that a thing of the past? There's a few, right? Let me tell you what mine is. I have determined that I'm no good at it. <clears throat> um, the, the resolutions, in fact, mine was, I think two years ago, I'm going to get a gym membership. I think I've been to that gym five times in two years. I'm paying money to not work out. I've learned that's not a really good thing. So my New Year's resolution is to cancel my gym membership um, pretty soon. My wife's saying, amen, finally. I've been talking to him. But I was looking up the the top 10 most common New Year's resolutions, and here they are. Exercise more. How many of you thought that? I need to exercise more. Doctors yelling at me to exercise more. Lose weight. Get organized. (laughs) Yeah, right. Learn a new skill or a hobby. Live life to the fullest. I need to save more money. Uh, I need to quit spending money. Quit smoking. I need to spend more time with family and friends. I want to travel more. I want to read more. Those are the top 10 most common New Year's resolutions. And one study showed that about 46% who made those resolutions were successful. What did that mean? That means that the the rest of us, 34%, are not successful at keeping resolutions. So when it comes to an end goal, when it comes to what is the main thing that we should focus on, can I just throw something out at you that is is kind of a no-brainer? It's it's one of those things in Scripture we know. It's going to sound so um, familiar, but it's it's, it's, it's a great time for us to reevaluate, to recalculate this thing called life and say, all right, God, what do you want from me in 2022? If I were to aim at one thing, what's the most important thing to look at? Is it my health? I mean, let me just be honest with you. I, I was uh, yesterday sitting on my desk, and I was counting funerals that I've either officiated, I've attended, or our church has hosted just in 2021, and I counted 10 just there. That's a lot of funerals. 
And that doesn't count the other 10 that are friends that I knew that I wasn't able to go to in different towns and states. Um, 20 funerals total last year. That's just a lot of disappointment. And there's a lot of people in those groups of people that probably their goal was to be financially independent, to be healthier, right? To spend more time with family, all of those things. At the end of the journey, what matters most? What's the most important thing? What is our end goal? Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the religious law, and he's been asked these questions, and they're challenging Jesus. Every time they, they ask Jesus questions, it's kind of like there's a, a low key. They're trying to catch him and to where they can use his words against him. And so they've been talking to Jesus about the resurrection. He's answered in a, in a good way that they liked. And so in Mark chapter 12, verse 28, it says, One of the teachers of religious law, one of these scribes, was standing there listening to the debate. So listening to Jesus and these other people debate the, the resurrection, and it says he realized that um, Jesus had answered well. So he asks the question. So he's already like, hey, I like what Jesus said there. He answered it well. Um, and so I'm going to ask him a question. And he says, of all the commandments, now let me stop there. Because in this context, when Jesus is talking to them, they had about 613 commands that they tried to faithfully follow in the Mosaic Law. 613 commands, all right? I have a problem with the Big Ten, don't you? But 613 commands that were binding commands that were very important. So they would sit around and debate all the time which ones are more important than the others. Which ones are weightier than the others? What is the most important command? And so they had like 600, or excuse me, 630, 613 total, 365 negative commands and 248 positive commands. Commands, But all these commands, and this guy steps up and asks Jesus, of all of those commands, which one is the most important? Which one's weightier? And Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. The most important commandment is this. Not one of the weightier ones, not one of the most important ones, but the most important command is this. Listen, O Israel. He goes to Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema it says, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. He starts there because there are a lot of false gods and there are a lot of different people worshiping different gods. And he wants to start by just saying, hey, there's only one God. He's the only Lord and God. So we need to know that first. Israel, there's only one God. There's only one and only Lord. And verse 30 says, and you must or you shall, this is a, a command, but it's a volitional command, meaning you had the, the, you could choose whether you want to obey it or not. It's commanded. We're not programmed like robots, but he's saying you're commanded to do this, love the Lord your God. To love, um, the word there, love, is agapeo. It's the verb, and it means to have a great affection or a care for or loyalty towards. It means to cherish or to take pleasure in. And he's saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you must, you shall love the Lord your God. Cherish the Lord your God. He says, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. Now, in the original Hebrew, where that was originally recorded in the Septuagint, there's a couple words there that are different. Well, the word uh, mind is not mentioned in the original Shema. And in the Septuagint, I, I might have mentioned Septuagint a while ago, but the Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew uh, Mosaic law and the, the first five books. And in that Greek translation, it omits the word heart out of that, oh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But Jesus includes it. And I think Jesus is including it because he's stressing the comprehensive nature of this command. This is the most important thing. If we don't get anything else in life, this is the end goal for us on the journey, recalculating, evaluating where we're at, what should we focus on and going forward into a new year. And Jesus lays it out. says the most important has always been and it always will be to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The heart's the control center. The soul is the self-conscious life. The mind is the thought capacity. The strength is the bodily powers. And I think we get the idea, right? He says, with everything that we have, we must, we shall love God. And the question is, why? Why? Well, I want to answer that because he loved us first. Amen? And he demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. That's love, right? 
So he says, love the Lord your God. Why? Because he is God and because he made a way for us to be made right in his sight. He made a way for us to be forgiven for our sins. We love him because he loved us first. And so he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your your strength. You know, if you consider the many goals that we have in life, the lists that we compile, you're like, man, I really would like to get financially independent by the end of the year, or, you know, I want to lose some weight by the end of the year, or I want to work on my marriage, or whatever we do, right? I want a new house, new um, city, whatever it may be that we put. We all these, these lists, and we pursue so many things in life. And I, and I just want to make it clear, just as a reminder for those of us that might forget from time to time, but all of that is emptiness without God. Why do we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? It's because he's everything to us. And when we pursue all these other things without him, Solomon says it's meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. In fact, I spent some time this week in that letter as well. In fact, I would encourage um, you to spend some time yourself reading through that small little letter. It's 12 chapters, but Solomon, the wisest person who ever lived. Here's his backstory. He's the son of King David. David was a successful king, and God gave to him a son, Solomon. And Solomon is now in control. David has moved on, and, and Solomon is the king. He's in charge. And he's asleep one night, and the Lord visits him in a dream, and he says, Solomon, ask for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. First Kings chapter 3. He says, what do you want? Solomon responded, hey, you've been so faithful to my father David, and these people of yours are great people, and I need wisdom and understanding so that I might be able to lead them in a way that's pleasing to you. Of all the things that he could have asked for, he asked for wisdom. He asked for understanding. He goes on to say that God said he was pleased for what Solomon had asked for, and he said because of that he gave him all the wisdom, and we know from history that he was very wise. He gave him all that, and he says, in addition to that, because you did not ask for wealth and long days and death of your enemies and all that stuff, I'm going to bless you. And so we also know from history that Solomon was an extremely successful king. He had it all. He had all the money. He had all the pleasure. He had 300 concubines. I mean, I think he had pleasure wrapped up, right? Some of us would say that was stupidity, but he had all of that. He, he, he had all kinds of wealth. He had all kinds of things he produced um, with his hands, his building accomplishments. And so in Ecclesiastes, he writes this letter at the end of his life. Now, he's old. He's very wise. He's got it all. He's had it all. And he's looking back almost reflectively at life under the sun from a human perspective. W- without view of God, this is the human perspective of life, everything under the sun. And here's what he says. When it comes to wisdom, wisdom He said, I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. He ends up up saying it was meaningless, like chasing the wind. He says in chapter 2, I said to myself, come on, let's let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. And so he started considering all the the pleasurable things. And he said, it was also foolishness or it was a chasing the wind, meaningless. Uh, He said, I I tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards and gardens and parks and filling them with all these fruit trees and all that stuff. He says it was meaningless. It was like chasing the wind. He talked about all the accomplishments that could be made. He considered those things, and he said it was futility or it was meaningless. It was like chasing after the wind. All the labor, he goes on and on and on. And he says, all the things that are going on under the sun, if you could have it, I had it, Solomon says. And when reflecting on all those things, without God, it is meaningless and empty. Can I get a big amen on that? Can I just tell you, church, life without God is meaningless and empty. In fact, Solomon goes on, and here he says, God has placed eternity in the hearts of every man. What that means is there's like this God-shaped hole in every one of our hearts. And we try to fill that. It's like I get pleasure, I get fulfillment out of filling it with stuff and with with the different things that we look at from the world's perspective. And Solomon's already been there, done that. And he's saying, hey, listen, it's like chasing the wind. It is meaningless. And he gets to the end of his little letter, and he says this. Here is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commandments, for this is everyone's duty. Listen to this. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Solomon's saying, hey, listen, apart from God, all this stuff is meaningless, and we don't really truly find meaning until we find God. 
And through that filter, when we have God, all these other things can bring us pleasure. Um, in fact, going back to what he has said about all the other things, he said, So I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. So back to the command, the greatest command, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Why? Because he is our source Without him, it's all meaningless, right? So think about the journey, and, and you say, Shane, I've been started off well in my, my devotion to God, and I was reading the Bible, maybe I was doing devotions or through the Bible in a year, whatever it may be. Um, I, I vowed to try to be a better follower of Christ, and then something happened last year. I took a detour. Maybe it wasn't any fault of your own, or maybe it was some sin in, in your life, and you just find yourself way off track, and then you just turn around twice, and you're like, man, I am totally lost, way off course, can I just tell you that this is a great time of the year, the beginning of a new year, to recalculate, to reevaluate and to say, all right, God, what's most important? What is the end for me? What, what, what is the end goal for me? And, and if I'm going to choose a resolution to focus on, it's like, you know what, God, I want to focus on those two things. It comes down to this, love God and love people. He goes on to talk about the second one is this equally important, Right? To love God and love people. How many know that's easy to remember? You don't need to stick it on the refrigerator. You can get up every morning and go, here's my goal for today. Love God and love people. And loving God might look like this. Hey, I'm going to go to church today. I'm going to make that sacrifice. I don't feel like it, but I know that it's good for me to be there. I want to be in the presence of other worshipers, and I want to worship God because he's worthy of my worship. I want to be there. Or it may be, hey, I want to begin walking through a devotion and just growing deeper in my faith. I want to love God. Here's another one. I need to be obedient to what I already know to be truth. Because how many know sometimes we struggle with obedience? I do. I'm the pastor. It's like, I know what the truth is, but then he says, okay, those who know to do good and do not do it, to them it is sin. And so for me to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength means I'm all in with God. And I, and I love him. I worship him. But I want to be obedient to him as well. How I many you know that's a worthy goal to pursue in our lives as followers of Christ? So that's the first one. Then he says the second one is just like it. He says, it's equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, no other commandment is greater than these two. Some of your translations will say, all the other law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So if you think of the 615 that they're debating rules and and, and commands, and he's saying, every one of those hang on these two. They're the most important thing for you and I to focus on. The end goal is to love God and to love people. Why do we love people? I and mean, the God part's easy, right? God's awesome. He created the heavens and the earth. He does amazing stuff. There's nothing too difficult for him. I can love God. It's the people that I struggle with. In fact, ministry would be easy if it weren't for the people. People can be difficult. And, and, and here's what I've seen in our culture today, in our community, um, in politics, with this whole pandemic stuff. We've seen a big divide We've seen a lot of division, dissension, hatred even in people groups, and it may be even in the families. And so like a year ago, you might have had a best friend and something happened there that caused a, 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 a split in that friendship, and now you're like, man, what happened? It just caused division. In families, hey, I don't, I don't agree with this. Well, I think we should, and we see these things going back and forth, back and forth. And if we love God who loves people, then it stands the reason that we should also love people like God loves people. Amen? And part of loving people means learning how to deal with people, learning how to live in community with people. It's like, man, if I could just live my life in solitude, away from all the people, it would be grand, it would be awesome. We weren't created for that. We were created for togetherness. In fact, you can go through Scripture, there's a lot of all-together verses where it says, one another, love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, bear one another's burdens, on and on and on and on. We are created for community, Right? And so a worthy goal to pursue is to love God with everything that we have, but to love people. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. I love myself. Not all the time. Sometimes I hate myself. I beat myself up worse than any of you ever will. But I also love myself, and I want to treat myself to the good things of life. And what he's saying is we're to love each other the same way we would love ourselves. Paul breaks it down a little better in Romans, and I just want to read this for us in reflection He starts by saying that we should offer our bodies as a a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing to him. And he says in verse 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. He says, then we will learn to know God's will for us, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And he says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I, Paul, I give you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Don't, don't think you're all high and mighty. Don't think that you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. You know what? Can I just let you in on a news flash? And I have to tell myself this too. I'm not perfect. And neither are you. Amen? So be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. There's this diversity, but there's this unity, togetherness. And he says, we all belong with one another, so we're going to be doing community with each other. We're going to live life with each other, going back to the command to love our neighbor as ourselves. It all kind of fits together. He says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, like to declare biblical truth, he says, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. Can I just tell you that we as pastors are going to see that challenged as we go forward in this thing called life? Because the Bible makes it clear that in the last days, there are going to be people, church people, who are going to gather around themselves, teachers, that will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. They will no longer want to hear truth. And I just want you to know, I've never been afraid of preaching truth until my dying day. I pray that God gives me that boldness and that confidence to stand up and declare the word of God, even if it offends everybody in the, in the house. Amen? I don't want to be, I would rather be obedient to God than to be a man pleaser and be disobedient to what God's called me to do. So if my gift is to declare biblical truth, by golly, I'm going to do everything I can in the power that he gives me. Amen? And so should you. He says, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach others um, well. He says, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, how many know we could use some encouragement in today's country? There's so many families that are going through it. And, and I just find myself, and, and I'm just being honest and transparent with you, I feel like a, the, the tanker truck that goes around to all the stations and fills them up. And, and sometimes if you're not careful as the tanker truck, you don't go back and get refilled yourself. You're running on empty and there's been so much need, so much heartbreak a- a- around me and just families that I find myself continually ministering and ministering and ministering. And I want to encourage them because I know there's power and encouragement. And we just need that so much. Amen? But so do we as pastors. We as leaders need it as well. And so if your gift is encouragement, then by all means, pick up the phone and, and encourage. I'm not saying that. I mean, it's going to be weird if 20 people call me after church. I'm like, yeah, I totally told you to do that. But, I mean, make it less, um, you know, conspicuous. But if your gift is encouragement, it says encourage one another. If it's to give, give generously. Why? Because our God is a generous God. And he, he blesses those who are cheerful givers. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And he says this, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them, cherish them, value them. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor like that. Like we love ourselves. Can you think of anything greater to pursue in our lives in 2022. I mean, I'm not against New Year's resolutions. If that's your thing and you can do it and you can follow that, then that's awesome. You're a rock star. Not me. But I can remember that. Love God and love people. So every day when I wake up in the morning, it's like, all right, God, what do you require of me? How about I start with this? Love God and love people. So God, I love you and I worship you. And if today's Sunday, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to worship you. Even if I, I'm not feeling it, it's a sacrifice of praise. And, and God, I want to open your word and I'm praying that you'll speak to me through your word. I pray that you'll fill me up and give me everything I need to love on the people that you've placed around me. God, I want to love you with everything that I am today. And if there's some disobedience in there and I found myself off track and I'm hearing this in my back of my head, the Holy Spirit's going recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. And then I'm listening to that still small voice and saying, all right, God, I confess that's sin I want to get back on that route I want to be in great fellowship with you or maybe it's with people and it's like God I I want to love people the way you love me and, and the way you're commanding us to love one another and so give me patience with people give me 
a heart of compassion for people. Give me um, the willingness to forgive easily and to not get offended over every little thing. I mean, it cracks me up. We were watching some TV shows, and we were laughing yesterday at some of the drama. that I'm like, I could never do that. It's just way too much drama for me. And some people live for it. Some people love it. I'm like, not me. I'm like, dude, you're either good or you're not. Are we good? Are we good? Great. That's awesome. Amen? It's like, love people. Love people genuinely. Don't just say you love them, but really love them. I can't think of anything greater to pursue than that at the beginning of a new year. And as we kind of begin this new year, just spend a little time this month just recalculating, thinking some things through differently, like just reevaluating some different things in life so that we're headed in this, this destination and the end goal will be to end up where we want to end up at. And, and I hope that at the end of 2022, we can look back and we can see some growth and improvement in our own lives. Like, hey, my devotion to God was stronger, even though the world got crazier. We, we sang the song all ago. In fact, um, let me find it. That's not it. That's not it. Oh, here it is. I like this one. I will sing when the world is upside down. That's a sacrifice, isn't it? <clears throat> I will sing though the troubles overwhelm. I will sing when the reasons can't be found. I will sing though my heart is on the ground. And all through the chaos, we will remember you are moving and you are good. You are the rest for the weary, the hope and the healer. God above all things, that's who you are. You are a truth that is standing when the world is changing. You are forever Lord of it all. Yeah, that's who you are. That's the God that we worship, amen? I can't think of anything greater to pursue this year than just saying, God, I want to love you more. I want to love you with everything that I have. And Lord, in that process of loving you, help me also to love other people like I would love myself. Forgive me for the times whenever we get at odds with one another. Help me be quick to forgive, quick to, be, uh, to resolve differences or um, opinions or arguments. And the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers. A peacekeeper is someone that says, hey, I don't want to rock the boat. Just leave it alone. But the peacemakers are the ones that roll their sleeves up and say, hey, we've got we to have a talk. We've got to fix this. Because I want restoration, I want healing, and I want to be in obedience to what God's called me to do. Amen? So who knows, what would it be like? What would it be like in 2022 if we pursued that goal as a resolution, recalculating like the end goal? What, what would it look like if I said, you know what, God, I want to pursue you and loving you with everything I have and loving other people as I love myself in the context of my family? Maybe some of those areas where we've gotten off track detoured, maybe from harsh words that were spoken or something that was no fault of our own, we find ourselves off track. It's like recalculating, God, how can I get this thing back on track and see my marriage flourish this year? Maybe it's in the spiritual department. You're like, Shane, I feel so empty. I feel so dry. I feel like I'm in a desert. And I just, I just need a rededication, a renewal of my faith to God. Uh, again, I tell you, his mercy is new every morning. I love that about God. That when we come to our senses like the prodigal son and we come back to him, he's not there with the rubber mallet, you know, ready to ping us on the head for our idiocy. You know, he's like, all right, welcome home. Amen. Isn't that just a beautiful picture of the love and the forgiveness and the mercy of God? And maybe that's where you're at today. I don't know what your step might look like, but I just wonder what it would look like in the church, in our community, in our country today, if we really grabbed a hold of this end goal. What is the most important thing? to love God and to love people. So simple, and we've heard it our whole lives, right? But very difficult to walk in. Let's make that our goal in 2022. So, so that if no matter whatever else happens around us, I mean, I pray that 2022 is not 2020 also too. <laughs> Have you seen that one? I pray that 2022 is not a dumpster fire. I pray that 2022 is a, is a great year in my family, in our church family, in our country, in our city. I pray that 2022 is an amazing year. But even if it's not, I have a God whose truth is always standing in a world that's changing. And that's all the hope that I need. Amen? And I would rather spend my efforts and my time just loving God in the midst of all the chaos and trying to love people the way he wants me to love them, to get to the end of it and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't know where you're at today, and as David mentioned, the first service when we're closing out, you, 
The, the most important thing for each one of us, we can't love God and love people unless we know God. And, and as I said, there's, it's, eternity has been put in the heart of every man. And God longs to fill that with him, not stuff. And, and if your pursuit is all the stuff in the world, I mean, it's always going to leave you wanting because it's meaningless without God. The most important decision that you and I can make is to place our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And obedience to God is greater than any sacrifice. And so I'd say, you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And so for you, maybe you just commit, God, I, I just, I confess that I've gotten way off track and I'm recalculating in my head right now. And, and I need to know, I know where I need to turn back. I know where I, I know exactly where I turned off, where I got off track. And for, for some, it's that I'm going to confess that sin and I'm going to turn around. Do a U-turn. For others, it's like, you know what, <clears throat> I want to get recommitted in my, in my faith and my church attendance and reading the scriptures and, uh, because I know God's worthy and he sustains us. And man, there's nothing more worthy to pursue than the God that makes it all possible. Amen? He's worthy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. And Lord, my way of commitment in a new year, I just, um, Lord, I, I humble myself before you. I know, God, that I don't have it all figured out. And there are many times I, I scratch my head and wonder, what was I thinking? And how did I end up here when I had great intentions at the beginning? Lord, I know I'm not alone. I know that all of us struggle at some point this way. And so, God, at the beginning of a new year, I, I just want to commit that year to you, Lord, personally and on behalf of this church as a pastor here at Living Water. I want to commit this year to you. Lord, let it be a year where we don't focus on the, uh, the, the temporal things that one day will burn or one day will just be totally gone, but we look to the eternal the ultimate end goal, Lord, that one day the journey will be over and we'll be in your presence. And it will not matter at that moment what we went through on this earth. It will not matter what money we had or what successes or pleasures or all these things. It's all meaningless without you. So, Father, I pray that if there be anyone in this room that has not placed their faith in you, that today would be the day that they trust in you for salvation. Lord, and for the others, I, I pray, God, that you would just put in us a desire to seek you more. Lord, to... To love you with everything, not just on Sundays, not just when it's convenient, but with everything that we have. And Lord, that is also reflected in our obedience to what you tell us to do. Lord, showing our love and commitment to you. God, I pray that we would uh, let the commitment uh, in that area with you. And God, that we would be intentional. Lord, in relationships, the people that you put around us, the people that you love that are created in your image. God, I know that for some it's a very difficult hurdle to cross when they've been hurt and offended. But God, I pray that this will be the year of restoration. That this will be the year that we can say, hey, listen, I know we disagree. But can we agree to disagree? I love you more than I love being right. Than I want to be right. God, I pray that you would just give us a, a, a heart to be compassionate to those that are going around. Uh, they're going through difficult seasons in life. God, that we would be uh, compassionate to show them love and encouragement and help and serving uh, Lord, that we would genuinely love them like we would love on ourselves. That we could just show some obedience in 2022 towards this end goal of loving you and loving people. I can't think of anything greater to pursue in a new year. So, Lord, would you please help us in that end. That you'd bring conviction where we need conviction. That you'd bring, uh, Lord, the opportunities our way to maybe close some of those gaps and, and to restore some of those broken relationships that need to be mended and Father, at the end of the day, we just uh, we want your name to be glorified. We want you to be honored in our lives. We want to live this life worthy of the calling that we have been called to, to love you and love people. That's our, our desire uh, this morning, and we humbly ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.